independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. The Labor Department announcing 3.84 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week. That brings the total to more than 30 million people filing for unemployment since the global pandemic began. Six weeks, 30.3 million people in six weeks. Number was higher than experts thought. But six weeks in, 30 million people. Soak that up for a second. That's massive. That is massive. And it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Not the virus or the problems that came with the virus. It sucks. Let's not pretend that it doesn't suck because it sucks. States across, and the biggest thing that's going on right now is states across the country, countries across the globe are all wrestling with how do we get back out there? I've said that when you decide to go, you go. Right? Is when you decide to make that decision, think of it as you're jumping out of an airplane, you're going to parachute. You're nervous. It's the first time you've ever done this. It's the first time for anybody that's ever done this. But there is no, nope, let's go back up. I didn't like the way I left. When you go, you go. Businesses cannot take the stop start. Businesses cannot be in a situation where they think, okay, we're getting back out there and all of a sudden we got to run back in. It, 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 It can't happen. When you go, you go. Now, are you going to err more on the side of caution? I've got no problem with that. Err on the side of caution if you want to. I don't, look, everybody's got to do what they think is right for their constituents and everybody's going to approach this no matter, and we're going to talk about data and truth and all kinds of stuff later but you're going to get all of the information coming at you you're going to get everything coming at you you're going to be looking at everything and then you're going to make that decision as a governor and whatever that decision is i think you have to say the path that we choose is the path that we're going to stay on you go and look across the country and see not only the data that they're putting out there as far as the health side of it. Look at the economic side of it as well. Here I am in Arizona, the prediction that they've come out with based on their data and model, and again, data and models, I, you know, I take them or leave them, but based on them, they're saying 25% 25 of small businesses will not reopen after this. That's, That's massive. As a business owner... The more I talk to them, and yesterday another two-week shelter-in-place order came down on high command from here, they said, look, we've kind of built ourselves into this. You know what I mean? Like, we've recognized we are where we are at this moment in time, and while we're not happy about it, this is where we are. They're looking at the second wave. What comes from the second wave? That's the fear that they have. That is the unknown that is left out there. And by the way, I don't know. Some countries have opened and now they're thinking about reclosing again. You're like, oh, that is that's impossible. If you continue to do that. You're not going to survive. You're just not. Jesse Lane is the chief operator of Nimble Crane in Pecos, Texas, one of the many service companies that support the oil and gas industry. However, their work has dropped off dramatically. Planes aren't flying. Cruise ships aren't sailing. Lane says there were signs of trouble long before the pandemic hit. An international price war driving the global supply of oil up and prices down. The situation only worsened by the sudden fall in demand. Everything, things that were our go-to in 2008 aren't the go-to 
right now. Energy propped up a lot of jobs in 2008. Businesses are looking around. You've got, if it isn't one thing, it's another thing. The battle on a day-to-day basis to keep people's businesses alive is absolutely real. And now, more unemployment. People are afraid to go out. The psychological side of things. More polls are showing, hey, what are you going to do if they open up? And people are saying, eh, I don't know if I'm ready to go out yet. Oh, you're not ready to go out yet? No. So even if they do open up, are you going to have customers? Maybe you're going to have a quarter of the customers that you once had. Those are the ones who still have a job and aren't too worried and the ones who aren't afraid to go out. Some may have a job, but they're not ready to to emerge. And then a good portion of them are struggling financially. It's not the best situation. Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, said this is the worst it's ever been, and it's not going to get better anytime soon. And I think he's right. Doesn't mean we're not going to get out of it, because we will. Doesn't mean we're not going to come out of it. We're going to be better for it and stronger, because I do think we will. But we can't deny that's real data. 30.3 million people is real data. It's not make-believe data. It's not data from this side or that side. That's real data data 323 538 at chad benson show is your twitter feel free to tweet at me you can text the program as well all that being said there is some good news out there absolutely in a potential therapeutic treatment now remember vaccines totally different vaccines blocks it from you getting it. So it blocks it, right? Ooh, go, go to take a shot. Boom. Dikembe Mutombo's wagging his finger. That's a vaccine. Treatment is you've got it, but we're going to help you because we've got a treatment that will knock it out. Fresh hope in the fight against coronavirus. The country's top infectious disease doctor announcing the drug remdesivir, originally tested for Ebola, may be effective in treating COVID-19, according to early trial results from an NIH study. The data shows that remdesivir has a clear-cut, significant, positive effect in diminishing the time to recovery. This is really quite important. The drug still needs to be peer-reviewed, but it will now be offered to very sick patients. Yeah, and that's, you know, as I say, the glimmer of hope. And that's what people need. It's the one thing I, I, I used to, when I played soccer and I was over in Europe and, you know, battling around the lower divisions and, and, and you know, just trying to make my way in, in, in a time when, you know, Americans weren't wanted over there. But I learned so many great things. And one of the good coaches, one of the great coaches I ever played for and I learned so much from uh, used to say when we would practice, you always end on a good, right? You always end on a good. And I always remembered that. And that's one of the things that we need to start taking into account is you have to end on a good, meaning there's got to be some glimmer of hope somewhere. And this may be the thing that is that glimmer of hope. If we find a real treatment that will allow a decent amount of people to feel comfortable to rejoin society the way that they did before knowing that if they get it i mean the goal is eventually to have a vaccine but that's far away away so their remdesivir as they call it remdesivir they're they're trying to roll it out as fast as possible we'll see what kind of results they get from it all patients are different so we want to make sure that we're tailoring their therapy to what their actual needs are In addition, we have seen great advancements in the care of these patients through our wonderful critical care teams and and other hospital teams. And so we want to integrate these therapies into that overall uh, model of care that they're receiving. That's Dr. Inesh uh, Mehta, who, you know, he's talking about the fact that, look, this is going to really sick patients, and these really sick patients are going to get these things. They're getting all the other care that they can, which is what people are hoping for. 
But now that they're rolling it out, that that's that's good. I mean, that, that's what we need. We need to see the glimmers of hope. Because the more I hear people talk, the more I hear people chat. You know, yesterday here, even at work, you know, I was talking to a couple people. They were very down because they feel like this is going to go on forever. And you have to keep your hopes up because it's not going to go on forever. This is a moment in time, albeit a, a massive moment in time. But it is not the new world that we live in. It is not going to be forever. It is a moment. And it does suck. And it is hurting a lot of people. If it's not hurting you physically, it's hurting you financially. If it's not hurting you financially, you know, I mean, it's hurting you mentally. If it's not, I mean, there's so many different ways this thing affects. And for some people, it's all of those things. But we will get through this. There's more treatments coming. The vaccine in Oxford, they are pushing hard, hard, hard for that. And so far, that looks good. But even if they got that, I mean, sped up may not be till the end of the year before we even see that. 323-538-2423, at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. Feel free to tweet at me. Raycon, best earbuds around. Love mine, you'll love yours. You're at home right now. Kids are screaming and yelling, right? Maybe you just, you're travel, you're a truck driver, you're on the road a lot. How about having the best earbuds around at half the price of all those other ones? Start well under a hundred bucks. Newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds. Six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, compact design, nice noise isolating fit. You're taking a call, guess what? You hear what the other person's saying and they hear you. Oh, maybe you're on a conference call or you're just wanting to binge a podcast and you want something comfortable, this is what they're all about. Stylish, cool, comfortable. You will love them. Right now, you're going to save even more. Save 15% off your order. Buyraycon.com slash Chad. Buyraycon.com slash Chad. Buyraycon.com slash Chad. Chad Benson Show. Set Chad straight. Text the show, 323-538-2423. That's 323-538-CHAD. Someone has to do it. Might as well be you. The Chad Benson Show. Without a vaccine, sir, why do you think the virus will just be gone? It's going to go. It's going to leave. It's going to be gone. It's going to be eradicated. It might take longer. It might be in smaller sections. It'll be... It won't be what we had. And, and we also learned a lot. Again, if you have a flare up in a certain area, if you have a I call them burning embers, boom, we put it out. We know how to put it out now, but we put it out and now we're equipped. Now we have more ventilators than anyone thought was possible. We do have a lot of ventilators. I mean, for all the arguing and yelling and stuff, I was listening to Governor uh, DeSantis in Florida. He's like, we have 6,000 ventilators and we only have 300 in use right now. So that's good. I mean, we've learned a lot. But how's it going to go away? I mean, just it's your gut. Your gut tells you it's going to go away. I don't I don't think that's probably going to happen. As far as you know, my gut, talk, but I do think it's going to dissipate. And if it's seasonal, it will go away and then it'll return. Fauci's like, well, it may return. It may not even leave. It's it, he errs on the side of caution. I try to explain that. I don't think he's deep state. I don't think he's here to destroy the world. I don't think he hates President Trump. I don't think he's best friends with Hillary Clinton. I think none of that stuff. I think he's a doctor and a scientist first and foremost. And Dr. Burks is a doctor, but she's also got the political side of her that is much different than Fauci. But I don't know if it's just going to go away. Maybe it does. Maybe it just disappears. Maybe it mutates so many times that it just becomes weaker because the clone of itself isn't going to be as good as the original. It's one of the things they talked about with the Spanish flu is it had mutated a couple times, and by the time it had come around, the antibodies were built up, the people that survived it had those antibodies. In the third phase, it just dropped off precipitously, and they said one of the things they thought is the strain had become weaker and weaker over time. It's a possibility. 
It is. And will we get a vaccine? Also a possibility. You hear a lot of very good stories. I'm hearing them really firsthand. Good stories. Very promising, but they have to test it. You know, maybe it's uh, not safe. Maybe it eradicates it, but it's not safe. And, uh, you know, they have to do testing with vaccines, whereas the therapeutics, it's, it goes a lot quicker in terms of the process. Yeah, because the therapeutics are drugs that have already gone through all the stuff, the hydrochloroquine, the uh, remdesivir. All of them have been used, tested and tried for other things. So they're using them. You can throw them against the wall. It's a little bit easier to do because they're already available. Vaccines way tougher. Way, way tougher. The hoops, the things that you have to go through, but they are fast tracking them, not just here, but globally. They are fast tracking stuff as as quickly as they can. The Oxford vaccine trial that they're doing, they went normally how it works is you start on very small little things. Then you get to mice, then you get to rats, then you get to ra- I mean, you, you go up each animal then you get to primates then the next step is humans they tried primates already they went straight there they gave a bunch of primates the vaccine then exposed them to the covid virus none of them got it and now they're trying to fast track the human trials because they believe they can get it done if this thing is as real. And the human trials, normally when you do that, it's it's a small sample group. They're going straight to 6,000. We need 6,000 people. But they got to be the right people. They have to be people that are living their lives, meaning people who are out day to day, who would come in contact potentially with other human beings, some of which may have the COVID virus. You can't do a human trial or any trial if you don't expose yourself to it which is part of the problem with sheltering in place is you may get this vaccine but never leave the house so you're fine truth not truth your data my data whose data oh my god chad benson show Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. Another 3.8 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week, bringing the total during the pandemic to more than 30 million. And that may be far fewer than the real total since states have struggled to process claims. Layoffs accelerated in the country as states move to contain the virus. And even as some places reopen, much of the U.S. economy remains effectively shut down. Yeah, shut down. And now it's the reopening time. That's the thing. How do you reopen? How do you go about reopening? It's a new thing for everybody. It's very interesting because this is th- this is my thing. Yesterday, I've seen governors across the country deliver. Gretchen Whitman, right? You know, uh, uh, you go and you look and you see, okay, DeSantis is doing this, Abbott's doing that. You look over here and you've got Newsom. You know, Doug Ducey in in Arizona, and you start just going through all of the, you know, Cuomo. Okay, what do you guys? You've got to be clear. Be black and white. Don't leave any room for interpretation. Don't make it a gray area when it comes to reopen. Say this, 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 and this. Yesterday, Doug Ducey, governor of Arizona, comes out. He delivers his, hey, we're staying, we're sheltering in place, but with a caveat, and the caveat nobody really understands. Everybody left more confused. Abbott was pretty clear, right? It's like, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this, and this is how we're doing it. Cuomo has been pretty, pretty clear. We're doing this, this is how we're going to go. Now he's thinking, okay, well, I'm going to start to open up a few other counties upstate who weren't as affected by this because 
But you've got to be clear. California, Newsom has been clear, but at the same time allows some stuff. Now we're going back and we're going to shut beaches. And it's it, it don't leave anything open for interpretation. Do the best you can to come out and say, this is what we're doing. These are the rules. We're going to go from there. Some workers also worried. Veronica Fields, a hairstylist in West Virginia, thinks it's too soon to go back to work because the guidelines are so unclear. I think that it's kind of crazy to go from completely shut down, but next Monday I'm going to be expected to figure out how to do full salon services on masked clients while I'm masked. But even if people don't feel safe to go back to work, some will have no choice. States like Iowa and Texas telling workers if they refuse to take their jobs back, they'll lose their unemployment benefits. Which I have zero problems in, in some cases. Like my little sister, God bless her, I love her. She's in California. She's making $1,000 a week being on unemployment. She didn't make $1,000 a week. She's like, why would I want to go back to a job? And I understand there's fear out there. I, I get that. But some people have it better right now in that situation. Now, that's going to end in July, and all of a sudden the gig could be up, and they're going to be going, oh, my God. But th- let's be real. There are some people out there earning more money. I was laughing. I was like, God. And 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 my other my other little brother, he's still employed. He he works for the Anaheim Ducks. He coaches their youth team. They're still paying him. And she's making far more money than he is. And I think that's kind of funny. It made me laugh a little bit. She's Mark Cookie. She is. Don't agree? But I understand why, you know, it would be tough. And I said, are, are you scared? And she's like, no, I'm not scared, but I'm getting $1,000 a week. It's like nine eighty five or something. I'm like, mm, well, you know what? 19, that's not bad. It's not bad at all. But you have to be clear. You can't come out and say, all right, we're going to open in two weeks, but restaurants, you can open in six days, but with these things... And you're like, well, hold on. You're telling people you can't go out for two weeks, but then you're telling the restaurants they can open in two weeks. And then you're telling this business over here, uh, you, you're you going to be open on Friday if you want to be open. But only by appointment. And then everything else has to be curbside pickup. But you can't do anything in the salon. It's, it's just just come out and say, look, this is what it is. This is how it's going to go. And don't leave any room for interpretation. It's not just America. The world is struggling of when to open. The Germans open. Now they're thinking about closing. There was a spike. Well, of course there's a spike. People are getting back out in society. Down under, they're having trouble. Scott Morrison, Prime Minister, get I Australia. What does success look like in a COVID-19 world? It doesn't just look like having a low number of cases. That's not good enough. Having a low number of cases, but having Australians out of work, having a low number of cases and children not receiving in-classroom education, having a low number of cases and businesses not being open, having a low number of cases and Australians not about, able to be going about their as normal of lives as possible. That's not what success looks like. He's right. It's not what success looks like. You can't. It's not coming back at once. Success looks like what it was before, which was this is what it is. We're back in business. We're great. But that's going to take a long time to get to. We've got to open in a smart way. That once we start it, we can't go back. We can't afford stop start. Because if you think this is bad right now, and it is, imagine if four, six weeks from now, we're going along and all of a sudden across the country, there's a few spikes here, a few spikes there, and then governors start just clamping down and Fauci and everybody says, no, we got to shut it down again. That second wave of unemployment and financial 
just destruction will be massive. So while you take this phases and steps, once you take the first step, know that you're going through all the phases. I would liken it to the fact that if you want to go outside when the sun's shining, you've got to put sunscreen on. This is the same thing. Australians want to return to community sport. If you want to return to a more liberated economy and society, it's important ensuring that we can have eased restrictions and Australians can go back to the lifestyle and the many things that they previously were able to do. We want that. We all want that. It's just when. That's the question. We see we see what's going on. We see the insanity of of some of just these crazy like government. You can't do this. You can't do that. Now we're going to, you know, California's like, ah, now we're going to shut the beaches. Supervisor Don Wagner put out a statement via Twitter. It reads in part that uh, he says he thinks Governor Newsom does have the right to shut down Orange County beaches and the beaches in the entire state, but thinks it's unwise to do so because he says doctors say fresh air and sunlight help fight the disease. He then issues what might be considered a threat, writing, I fear that this overreaction from the state will undermine the cooperative attitude and our collective efforts to fight the disease. So we'll see what happens. And if Governor Newsom winds up following through on what the state chiefs of police say he said he was going to do. So you open stuff up, you allowed some people to go back. Now the parks are going to be shut and you nobody wants to stop start. And it's not just businesses, individuals, you, I, everybody. The breaking point is there for a lot of people, and it's growing day by day. The the groundswell of of people that it started out as, you know, release us, let us get out there, this is ridiculous, it, for whatever reasons, whether you thought it was an overreach by the government, or the, that is growing, and that is continuing to grow. And you're finding more and more businesses are willing to fi state rules because they feel like i got to get out there i have to work i have to earn a living when you do this whichever phase that you decide hey we're gonna do this we're gonna do you gotta do it you've got to do it you've got to take that step and you've got to move forward and you can't say nope we're gonna i know we came out but it was no 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 we got we got to go back in We, we we've got to go back in jerry nadler are eager to reopen their businesses. But you've got several things to consider. Number one, people are not going to come back to restaurants so fast when they're worried about their own health. That's a little premature. Second of all, you can't reopen businesses until we have enough testing that has been done. And far from enough testing has been done to justify allowing people to, to, to reduce the uh, social distancing requirements. The testing thing is weird, too. I'll tell you why. So... You want to open up your state? All right. You have to have, if you're going to follow the CDC, what do you have to have? You have two weeks of showing over. And, and I don't even know what the two weeks is. It is it a, you every single day you have to have less and less than the day before? Or is it cumulative over these two-week period? It was less than the previous two-week period. I, I That I can't tell you. Does it take in deaths or people who have tested positive for it? Or is it a cumulative of those? So let's say over a two-week period, we went down, down, down. But we had a big spike. But then we went down, down, down again. And those two weeks, though, if you compare that to the previous two weeks, it's far less. But we did have a big spike here. Do we have to go back? I I, I don't know. Those are things that I, I, I can't tell you with. And as far as testing goes, well, you can make that. As you go. If your governor wants to reopen. You can look at the test. You can manipulate the numbers. How many people are you testing? Some states are testing. God knows how many people a day. Some are testing a lot. Some are testing thousands. Some are testing hundreds. It's not like there's, oh, we're going to test 100,000 people a day at each state. That's not happening. And that test is a false flag, too. Because you could get tested today. Two days from now, you can come in contact with somebody. You could then 
get the virus. You'd have it for two weeks. You'll come in contact with more people. And all the while, you've been telling you don't have it. So that's also a mess. It's confusing. You need to be straightforward. We need to start saying to ourselves, come up with a uniform plan of when we do this, we do it. Whether you're taking a baby step or a giant leap, either way, we're not going backwards. Because the backwards is the thing that most business owners that survived this first one are uncertain about and fear the most. Because they can't. And in some cases, even if they can, they won't do it again. 323-538-2423, at Chad Benson Show, Twitter. Feel free to tweet at me and text the program as well. AMAC, Association of Mature American Citizens, fastest growing organization for people over the age of 50. Great organization. They're here to help you with everything from Social Security to Medicare. They've got questions and answers and answers and questions. You name it, they're going to help you with it. They're also out there fighting on your behalf for common sense immigration form, things like that. And they have so many benefits from retail, restaurant, travel discounts, all of those things. So when we do reopen, and we will, you'll be able to take advantage of that. Here's the great thing. The price is amazing. It is free. Free. Free, 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 free. That's right. No credit card, no cash, no check. Nothing's required. You just go and you sign up. You go to amac.us forward slash Chad. It's one year. It's free. It's on me. amac.us forward slash Chad. amac.us forward slash Chad. Chad Benson Show. Check out our Chad Benson Show Facebook page where you can hang out or hang your grievances out to dry. This is Chad Benson. So with unemployment, again, another 3.8 file today. We're over 30 million in the last six weeks. Some states are worried that people are trying to cash in on it. Multiple unemployment opportunities, right? There's going to be fraud, and I'm sure there'll be a little bit of fraud. Come on, it's government, and there's fraud everywhere. Governor Andy Bashir of Kentucky says, ah, man, this, this, people have to stop double dipping. Got to stop double dipping. These fake names out there, like Tupac Shakur. <laughs> Only to find out there's actually a guy who filed for unemployment. That's really his name. Governor felt like a, a ding dong. Now, somebody, an apology. You know, last night I spent a little bit of time talking about fraudulent claims holding us up and mentioned an individual that had filed in the name of Tupac Shakur. I didn't know, and it's my fault, uh, that we have a Kentuckian who goes by Malik Tupac Shakur. I talked to him on the phone today. I apologized. It's my fault. He was gracious. Uh, I said, I'm, I'm sorry if I embarrassed him or caused him any attention. He didn't want. He was uh, very kind. He ended the call. God bless. And we're going to make sure that we resolve his claim. Malik, thank you for being so kind. I'm sorry. That was kind of funny, though. And everybody's like, that was racist. I think he just threw it out there. But everybody find, you, you, even in these crazy, chaotic times, you can find a way to make sure that something's racist. That was funny, though. Like, Queen Elizabeth, Tupac Shakur. Oh, there is somebody called that? Elvis Presley? Oh, there's somebody called Elvis Presley? Really? Oh, well. <laughs> Guess what, kids? It's a world of laughter, a world of tears. Oh, it's a Mick. world of hopes and a world I, I love that song. Mickey. Hi. Hi. Whoa. Oh, good. Are you okay? I, I, oh, uh, it's been, been tough, Ch- Chad. I, I've, 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 we're shut down. I get it. I just, I don't, I don't, I, oh, I just don't know what to, I don't know what to do. We can't open. Well, you might open in Florida soon. What? Yeah, soon. You the Florida. They're thinking. Well, we're gonna open. You. Are you? Are you being serious? Are you? Are you being ser- serious? Ser- serious now? 
Yeah, yeah. Just right now, they're thinking about it. Well, what? What? Under what conditions? Can I just open the park? Say, come on in. No, 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 no. They're going to have uh, reduced capacity, fifty percent at for fifty. That's I can't. What am I going to do with fifty? Well, it's better than nothing. I'm just, I'm thinking out loud. That's all I'm doing, Chad. Think thinking out loud. It's been tough. It's been we just oh. And you have to have everybody wear masks who work at the park. Oh, jeez. And then you have to take the temperatures before they. Oh, yeah. It's it's it'll be different. I just, oh man, I I I just, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go lay down. Okay. Three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three at Chad Benson shows your Twitter. May reopen fifty percent capacity. Phase one, phase two, 75%. And hopefully by phase three, it's knock yourself out. It's the new world now. It's not the new world forever. Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. Another 3.8 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week, bringing the total during the pandemic to more than 30 million. And that may be far fewer than the real total since states have struggled to process claims. Layoffs accelerated in the country as states move to contain the virus. And even as some places reopen, much of the U.S. economy remains effectively shut down. Yeah. And the stuff that is reopening, in many cases, is unsure how to go about doing that. And as they reopen, they don't know who's going to come out and spend money and who's not going to come out and spend money. This is an ugly, ugly, ugly situation. James, uh, uh, head of Jerome Powell, head of the Fed yesterday, they were talking about interest rates and whatnot and unemployment. And uh, he was a straight shooter. In the near term, we're going to see, you know, significant declines in economic activity, significant declines in employment and increases in unemployment. We're going to see that as a consequence of the virus and the measures we're taking to protect ourselves from it. He's right. He said this is the worst thing since the Great Depression. And it is going to be a long battle to get back. And when I say normal, we're going to get back to hugging each other, going to games. That stuff's going to come before the economic rebound comes. I do not believe for a hot second that this is our normal life. I do not believe for a minute that this is the way we're going to live out for the foreseeable future. This is a moment in time. It's uncomfortable. It's ugly. And as this person, quite frankly, put it. When you look at it sitting here and you get knocked back two years, it's depressing. It is depressing. But we've got to find ways to get through it. Got to have a smile on their face. There is hope. Yeah, baby, help. Vaccine still far away and may not even be possible. Some scientists say this is going to be something we're going to get done in the next year to 16 months. Some scientists say they might have something by the end of the year. And some say, eh, slow your roll. We may get a vaccine and it may be okay. And we may not get one at all. So then you move to the next, which is treatments, therapeutic treatments. And we may have a glimmer of hope. Fresh hope in the fight against coronavirus. The country's top infectious disease doctor announcing the drug remdesivir, originally tested for Ebola, may be effective in treating COVID-19, according to early trial results from an NIH study. The data shows that remdesivir has a clear-cut, significant, positive effect in diminishing the time to recovery. 
This is really quite important. The drug still needs to be peer reviewed, but it will now be offered to very sick patients. That's good. That's what we want. We want the therapeutic. Therapeutic comes faster than vaccine. Vaccine, long way away, lots of testing. Therapeutic, hey, we've already got these drugs. They work on some stuff. Let's see if it works on this. Dr. Jen Ashton. Literally, just as this news was breaking from the NIH international trial here in the U.S., simultaneously, results of a study conducted in Wuhan, China, using remdesivir against placebo in critically ill COVID-19 patients found no significant effect. They did have to stop that trial early because they simply didn't have enough patients after their aggressive lockdown maneuvers. I, I'm I'm. I'm going to say this. I don't believe anything the Chinese say. And I'm not talking about the people. I'm talking about the actual government. You have to separate the two. When we criticize China, it's not the Chinese people. It is the government. It is the government. I don't believe anything they say. So... We'll move on from there. I will go with what NIH is saying and that this looks like this could be something that works. Now, what does that mean? That's the big thing. All patients are different, so we want to make sure that we're tailoring their therapy to what their actual needs are. In addition, we have seen great advancements in the care of these patients through our wonderful critical care teams, and, and other hospital teams. And so we want to integrate these therapies into that overall uh, model of care that they're receiving. And that's good. Integrate the therapies, meaning, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're doing all of these other things. Now we're going to start bringing some of these therapeutics in that are showing promise. Dr. Fauci said that they actually are now making this the standard of care, meaning they will be telling patients that it's an option. They can't ethically continue to give patients placebo when they've already seen a demonstration that remdesivir has such a positive effect. And so how they do these trials, you get 20 patients, you get 30 patients, 100 patients, I don't know how many, and th- they went with give some placebo, give some of these. These ones over here who had the actual drug were showing marked improvement. These people sick too. They weren't showing marked improvement. And sometimes you go, okay, we got to have enough. We, we, we're seeing this. We've got to, ethically, we've got to do this. We've got to move this over. So now we'll see what ends up happening. Dr. Fauci said that it proved that it can block the virus. It shortened the duration of symptoms by about four days from 15 days on average to 11 days. And there was a suggestion that it reduced the risk of death from 11 percent in patients who got placebo down to 8 percent in patients who got remdesivir. It's not zero, but the people that they were targeting this with were people that were critically ill in the hospital not the going to the doctors like if you got the flu uh, they throw everything against the wall once you get in there if you've got but that's what's that look like for somebody who has this they're showing signs but they're not sick enough to get into the hospital and you give them this what does that look like it's an option There'll be more options, I'm sure, sooner rather than later. But what that allows us to do as we find more of these options is give people open saying, hey, we're going to open up the economy. Tomorrow, phase one, we're going to open it up. It's the old, uh, was that movie, The Field of Dreams? If you build it, they will come. Well, if you open it, doesn't mean people are going to show up. There are a lot of people in this country who are nervous, nervous about going out, nervous about returning to work, nervous about being out amongst people because they've been told for the last eight weeks that this is a death sentence, which it's not. 
so they're nervous. Those people are a huge block of people. We're not talking about 3% of America. We're talking about 30 or 40% of America who still have fears. Will this alleviate all of their fears? No. But for some of them, knowing there's a real treatment out there potentially will alleviate their fears enough to get back out there. Some are still like, hey, until there's a vaccine, I don't want any part of it. But that's a small group of people. So you not only have to have a treatment that actually treats the people that are sick, you have to have a treatment that you show the people that aren't sick that should you become sick. There are therapeutic methods that will help you get better. And that is really important. Because as we return back to getting out amongst each other, The crowds grow. You start to go back to eating at your favorite restaurant. You start to see the social distancing, you know, or physical distancing start to slowly but surely dissipate. You're you're back in the flow of things. You're at work every day. You're high fiving your friends. Maybe you go to the movies. You need to be confident enough to do those things, to get back out there, to 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 get back in the flow of of life because that's where organically the economy will start to move again. If you don't feel comfortable going to the movies or a restaurant, opening them up means very little. So the psyche is as important as the health side of it physically. 323-538-2423 at Chad Benson show is your Twitter. You can tweet at me. You can text the program as well. Love hearing from all of you. Love and hate. I get a lot of people who are upset. They don't like the way that I think that, that, that we should have taken this on. And I get that, you know, people say things right now, especially because everybody's on edge. Everybody's stressed out. Everybody is in this weird kind of daze. You've gone to the, you know, to a shopping at the store, grocery store, People are, they keep to themselves, their heads are down, some are wearing masks, nobody wants to look you in the eye. It's its its a weird thing, and I get people are scared, because every person you come in contact with that you don't know looks at you potentially as a carrier. Whoa. You could be the one. Patient zero. It's not, it's not the reality. <laughs> People know that. Like it it told, we've talked about before, you couldn't even tell me where you got it if you've got it. Unless you're inside the house with somebody who's had it and you haven't left the house. You, you, if you go outside the house a few times a week, you wouldn't probably know. You retracing your stuff. What can I count? You you don't. It's important that that psyche changes, but we also have to start treating each other a little bit. And I get the edge side of things. It's a lot of edge out there. People are, uh, just breathe, smile a little bit, laugh a little bit. There's a lot to laugh at, kids. There is. 323-538-2423, at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Car Shield, helping you save money on stuff. You got a car. You like your car. You say, that's my car. I, say, I like your car. Say, hey, I got Car Shield. You should get Car Shield. And they say, why, Chad? I said, because you get 24-7 roadside assistance, a rental car for free while your car's in the shop. Shop's the shop that you choose. You go from there, right? So you choose any shop, eh, pay a small deductible, they get them paid directly, it's a win. They're like, what about all the electronics in the car? Well, they cover that. What if I just want my transmission and engine? They cover that. Is it expensive? Starts at 99 bucks a month. They got a plan that's right for you. Well, how'd I get a hold of them? So you call 800 car, 6,000. Mention Code Benson saves you 10%. Tell them exactly what you're looking for. 800 cars, 6,000. Code Benson saves you 10%. Plans start as low as $99 a month. That's a win. You can also go to carshield.com, carshield.com. Use that Code Benson. When you do, it saves you 10%. And remember, a deductible may apply. Chad Benson Show. Being 
antisocial sucks. Hang with Chad's friends on Facebook, The Chad Benson Show. And if you just need some alone time, head on over to Twitter at Chad Benson Show. Either way, we can't wait to meet the real you. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off. Now it's time to find out what's trending. What's trending? Yeah, what does that mean? I mean something, right? Like it's trending on the old internet. What's trending? On a spit up Thursday. A lot trending. Impeached for life is trending. Of course it is. Comey is trending. And the reason for that is, well... Some issues with the FBI. Well, the FBI has some issues when it came to the way they handled uh, Flynn. It was not. Uh, let's just say that there, there, there's a lot more questions in the the way that the FBI have gone about their business. The left will try to spin it, but eh, this one's this is not a good look for them. Let's just put it that way. Bengals have released Andy Dalton, the Red Rifle. He's trending. Big time. And, of course, COVID-19. And 3.8. 3.8 million Americans filed for unemployment last week. Trending right now on Twitter. You go over to the Google. You find out that Google's trends are totally different. Why? Because it's Google. Britney Spears is trending. She actually burned down her home gym. <laughs> Come on, isn't that the na- the laugh we need? Literally, she said, oops, I did it again. And down went the gym. <laughs> it's not very nice. Leave her alone. Leave her alone. Remdesivir is trending. People are saying it has the clear-cut power to fight the coronavirus. The clear-cut power. To fight it. Yeah, indeed. Devin Booker, basketball player, was spotted with Kendall Jenner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Facebook stock also trending. Up it went. Erp, 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 erp. And Assassin's Creed, The Last of Us. The, the reviews are out. This is what I love Sexism Plague. In Assassin's Creed. I'm like, what the hell is that all about? I don't even, at this point in time, I don't even know. I don't they make video games anymore. And Michael Flynn is trending because the cops, the FBI, had some stuff that they did, and it doesn't look good for them in the way that they handled him. It's pretty apparent to me that General Flynn was a victim of an out-of-control Department of Justice. He basically got railroaded. It is pretty widely known that the Obama administration didn't have much use for General Flynn. Attorney General Barr needs to be complimented. He's doing the right thing. He has three goals that I share. Restore trust, hold people accountable who have uh, engaged in misconduct, and right wrongs like General Flynn and I believe eventually Papadopoulos. Papadopoulos. We've had Papadopoulos on it. But... The FBI, there was some stuff inside these unsealed things that the prosecution didn't throw out there, but Flynn's attorney has that, quite frankly, yeah, they don't look nice. It looks really bad for the FBI. It did look like, in certain cases, they were definitely coming after Trump. Uh, But it was, it's just not a good look. It's not. 323-538-2423. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. This is the Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. 
The Labor Department announcing 3.84 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week. That brings the total to more than 30 million people filing for unemployment since the global pandemic began. 30 million people. 30.3 million. That's real data. Like We see that, and that's real data. It's changing on a daily basis, second by second. It's more and more states figure out their glitches and whatnot, but that's real data. Data's great, but it's only as good as the people that are putting it in. And if you are trying to sell something, you're going to find the data that supports your whatever it is that you're trying to sell us. That's 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 truth. That is absolutely the truth. If you have something that you want to sell, scientists go out to prove certain things. So they're going to find the data that supports their argument and the way they're trying to do it. That's why they say, was it peer reviewed? Why? Because when you peer review something, other scientists are going to take shots at your data. Your theories, they're going to put them to the test. They do that. It's crazy, right? So right now, as odd as this is, in a pandemic, it is now devolved into the right versus the left. My information versus your information. Here's this data. Here's that data. The other day, Two doctors, Bakersfield, California. We call it Baker's Neck. For those of you who don't know where Bakersfield is. Central part of California. They came out with conflicting data to the data that's out there. And people got upset about it. We've seen 1,227 deaths in the state of California with a possible uh, incidence or prevalence of 4.7 million. That means you have a 0.03 chance of dying from COVID-19 in the state of California. 0.03 chance of dying from COVID in the state of California. Is that, does that necessitate sheltering in place? Does that necessitate shutting down medical systems? Does that necessitate people being out of work? That's Dr. Erickson, then, right? So... They did this hour-long thing. It was on YouTube. It's since been pulled. YouTube and a bunch of other places. says, no, it's false information. It's a bunch of baloney. Uh, it's lies. Tucker Carlson, them, take it up, say, this is what's going on. You're having all these things being cut down, and people are taking it off. It's just a bunch of lies, 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 yeah. Because why? Because you didn't like their data or how they got their data? Again, data is only as good as... As who's putting it in. Everybody has biases. I have a bias for stuff. You have a bias for stuff. We're human beings. That's human nature. If you had no biases, then you're a zombie. Because biases come in all shapes and sizes. So they said it's it's no different than the flu. We aren't pressured to test for flu, but ER doctors now, my friends that I talk to say, you know, it's interesting, when I'm, when I'm writing up my death report, I'm being pressured to add COVID. Why is that? Why are we being pressured to add COVID to maybe increase the numbers and make it look a little bit worse than it is? I think so. It's a real possibility. We will never know the numbers. Some people are getting, who are passing away, they're, they're attributing it to COVID may not have COVID, and some people have passed away from other things. May have died from COVID, but it was attributed to other things. We'll never know the real numbers. Like, you go look at the Spanish flu. If you look at the Spanish flu, and you just even go to the Wikipedia, you don't even have to read any of the, just go, it's 20 to 50 million. Like, that's a big jump. And new data from that says eh, it could have been closer to 12 million. So that's the right. The right's come out saying, hey, look, this is this is ridiculous. We've destroyed the economy for this, this, and this. And it's really 
not that much worse than the flu. And even data on the left, or not left, but it should just be science, even data from other scientists support that if you're a healthy individual between 18 and 45, it's the same level as the flu. And their numbers are kind of the same here if you're healthy up to 65. It gets a little tricky after that. So now you've got to be dunk, you know, debunked, right? So so they go and then Chris Hayes takes on these guys. But then we also talk about and and look, here's the thing with Chris Hayes. I I I don't mind. He can be, a, a, you know, he's he's an odd bird. I always joke about him. I think he looks like the caterpillar from Disney. But these guys are being taken off. And he's come out and he fires back and talks about how bad things, you know, this stuff is. And and these guys are in it for the money. And, and of course, I mean, come on now. You'd be stupid. But you, th- like I said, they were taken down from YouTube. Because they talked about something that went against what all of the other things people are saying out there. And it's this sci- It's funny. This is the beauty of science. They even fight amongst themselves of whether something is real or not. So I said the other day that the 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 professor and doctor from Stanford comes out and says, look, you know, these we're going on models that are hypothetical that are wrong on a daily basis. We we look at empirical evidence and we we poo poo that. But then we also talk about um, removing information that is problematic. You know, of course, anything that is medically unsubstantiated. So people saying like, take vitamin C, um, you know, um, take turmeric, like those are all will cure you. Um, those are the examples of things that would be a violation of our policy. She's the CEO of YouTube. It's a violation of our policy. So taking vitamin C is a violation of policy. It's not going to cure you. It's not horrible for you, though. Um, anything that would go against World Health Organization recommendations would be a violation of our policy. World Health Organization. The last time I checked, they told us what? When that tweet? That this doesn't spread human to human? Don't wear a mask or do wear a mask? I'm not quite sure. Um, anything that would go against World Health Organization recommendations would be a violation of our policy. And so remove is another really important part of our policy. So you're not just putting the truth next to the lie. You're taking the lie down. That's a pretty aggressive approach. A lie says who? Like, those are the things that I think it's fair to question. Yeah, I'd like to see how these guys got their data. But there's a lot of data that people ask for. I want to know, I don't need to know the who these people are, but if we're breaking things down and, and you're going to use data to close down everything, then can we find out, all right, comorbidities. How old are the people? If this affects 65 to 90-year-olds in a much different way, especially with comorbidities, and that's who it seems to cause the most damage to, then maybe, just maybe, We know that when you ask certain things, because if you're a politician, right, so you're a politician, the last thing that you want to see come out of this is the numbers that say "Ah, this is this wasn't that much worse than the flu at the end of the day. That's so you put us in a recession based on that. So, no, you don't want to see any of those numbers. And any numbers that may contradict the way that you've been telling people to act is politically bad. But data is only as good as the people putting it in there. If your data is false, either you falsified it or the numbers you're getting aren't right, or you're only getting partial data, or you're carving out data to make it fit the narrative you want, And both sides do it for every single thing they possibly can. That's why I say you look to the right, you look to the left, get out of your hermetically sealed bubble. If you want to know the truth, you may have to do a little bit of digging. And I'll usually tell you this. The truth lies somewhere in the middle. It may go a little bit to the right. It may go a little bit to the left. But rarely is it all the way to one side. 
Now, of course, most public health experts have dismissed these doctors' findings. According to the University of Washington biologist Dr. Carl Bergstrom, who specializes in infectious disease modeling, quote, they have used methods that are ludicrous to get results that are completely implausible. Two national physicians groups describe the doctor's claims as reckless. And out of this, quote, as owners of local urgent care clinics, it appears these two individuals are releasing biased, non-peer-reviewed data to advance their personal financial interests without regard for the public's health. Their personal financial interests. Of course. Everybody's got personal financial interest. University of Washington, their models have been wrong, I don't know, how many times. Now, some of that is because we have changed our behavior. Some of that is. Not all of it. Not all of it. But I talk to doctors who are a little bit more towards the the, the first doctors talking about this isn't as bad as everybody says it was going to be. I try to look at data. How many hospital beds are actually being used for COVID? Well, I'm here in Phoenix, about 9%. California's got 40 million people. You've got 50,000 people maybe infected by it? Now, we don't know how many people really have had it. Because if you found out that it's actually closer to 5 million people that have had it, and you've only had 1,000 deaths, well, that changes everything. And that most people were asymptomatic. But it changes. And something about this thing is, look, I I was talking to my uncle last night. I said, dude, because he's just, oh, it's all crazy. It's all lie. He doesn't think it's a hoax, but he thinks it's overblown. And and, and I think some of it is. And I think some of it's part of the, the media. But I said, we don't know what's going to happen in six months. Six months from now, everybody who had COVID may explode. We don't know, right? We don't know. But what I do know is they get things wrong all the time. Partially because it's novel. And as they start to, today, there's something out that says, well, kids don't really spread it to their parents. Very rarely does it go from child to adult. I'm like, what? Well, according to this study. But remember, when you listen to studies, always look to find out who's paying the people who are doing the study. You'll find out what their biases are much faster so you can interpret it in a much different way both sides have the truth that they want everybody to see somewhere in the middle is the reality this thing is real and it is dangerous but it's dangerous for a certain group of people and yes every once in a while somebody who's healthy will die from it just like people who are healthy die from the flu and every once in a while somebody who's older and has comorbidities, survives this, just like people do with the flu. It spreads easier, so it has a little bit bigger of a net. But it's not the death sentence that everybody says it is. 323-538-2423, at Chad Benson shows your Twitter. Feel free to tweet at me, my pillow doing something amazing for everybody out there. First, they're helping in the fight against COVID-19. They're starting to ramp up their production. And in the midst of producing so many masks for people across the board on top of that. So all these hospitals now are going to be getting masks from MyPillow. That's pretty amazing. But on top of that, they've said, hey, we've got to get rid of all of this stuff in the warehouse because we have to house this stuff. So what do they do? They said, buy one, get one free on everything. You name it, they've got it. I'm talking about your Giza towels and dream sheets, your Supima My Pillows, the My Pillow towels, roll and go anywhere pillows. You name it. It's buy one, get one free. You get a 6 day money back guarantee, a 10 year warranty, and everything's made in the USA. Now, to get this, you go to mypillow.com. There's a new radio listener special. You type in code Benson. On the way out of checkout, if you order Mike Lindell's book, he's going to give you free shipping and give you a $25 gift card towards your next purchase. It's simple, it's easy. And it's buy one, get one free with a 60-day money-back guarantee. What? What? MyPillow.com, promo code Benson. MyPillow.com, promo code Benson. Chad Benson Show. Warning. 
no snowflake zone. Uninformed opinions are in danger of melting. The Chad Benson Show. President Trump reacted to Major League Baseball's latest idea of how to restart the season. They're considering splitting the 30 teams into three regional divisions and restricting them to play within their region. Another idea is having teams play in Arizona, Texas, and Florida to empty ballparks. The president's not a fan. I saw baseball's doing something very unusual. I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. President Trump would rather see his team play at their home park. I guess I'm a traditionalist, but I think they'd be able to play at Yankee Stadium with... uh, Obviously, smaller crowds. But any plan would be subject to medical approval plus consent of federal, state, and local authorities. And Fauci said we may have to learn to live without sports. Sweden saying we're learning to live with the virus. Separate things. Here's a perfect example of contrasting ways that you go about doing things. Sweden's got a higher death rate than their neighbors, yet at the same time, they recognize the mistakes they made early on, which was the vulnerable, in particular, the older generation in confined areas like nursing home, long-term care facilities. And the second part, they said, was uh, when it comes to their immigrant community, where they suffered a lot of losses really early, a high number, they struggled with that because they said there was a real language barrier when they were talking about this and putting certain things in place. But their immunologist, their guy, is different than our guy. They both have facts and figures. They both see it totally different. It's How do you know who to believe, right? One day you wear a mask, the next day you don't wear a mask. One day it's like, oh, no, this helps if you do this and you wear gloves and a mask. And then the next day it's like, okay, well, the mask isn't necessary Yes, good on the gloves, but you have to wash your gloves and or throw your gloves away every time. And then you're like, okay. The conflicting messages. Then you add conflicting messages from governments telling you how to reopen your business or not reopen your business. And you can, but you can only do this. And then you're scratching your head because you feel like a chameleon standing on a rainbow. You don't know what color to turn. That's confusion. Lots of information, lots of data, everything flying at you. And all you want to do is live your life. 323-538-2423, at Chad Benson shows your Twitter. I think the best viable thing for Major League Baseball, potentially, Arizona, at least for the foreseeable future if you're going to do it, And then as soon as the lockdown continues to ease, move people back to their stadiums, limit the amount of people, and then hopefully by the time the playoffs come around, it's game on. Let's do it. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show. It's your Twitter. It's the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. Another 3.8 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week, bringing the total during the pandemic to more than 30 million. And that may be far fewer than the real total since states have struggled to process claims. Layoffs accelerated in the country as states move to contain the virus. And even as some places reopen, much of the U.S. economy remains effectively shut down. Yep, shut down still. Shut down, shut down, but kind of opening up, but not really sure. Like, we're going to, but we're then we're, maybe some tonight, the expiring of the 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 thing. With, and I love it. It's Trump stay at home. Trump, it's, it's CDC guidelines. This is what we need to do. You guys do what you do in your states. Each state's going to handle themselves. Remember, we have 50 individual countries, essentially, and they have their rulers. Their rulers are their governors. There's state senators and congresspeople. 
And then you have confusion because nobody's quite sure how, what, so do I, and then how does this go? I don't know. Like, what am I supposed, you can go outside, but you can't. But if you do, that's fine, but you can't go anywhere. But if you go to the store, that's okay. You can't go in there, but you can order something and they can bring it to you. But then maybe next week you can go in there as long as you social distance correctly. And But how, how would anybody know? Hmm. It's tough, right? Everybody's having trouble trying to figure out how this works. What are you supposed to do? What are you not supposed to do? How do you do it? What's it look like when you do it? All the while waiting for what? The magic fixer. The vaccine would be great, but we're far away from that. And it may never come to fruition the way that people want. Then you got therapeutics. Those are the ones that can be used now. You hear a lot of very good stories. I'm hearing them really firsthand. Good stories. Very promising, but they have to test it. Promising. You know, maybe it's uh, not safe. Maybe it eradicates it, but it's not safe. And, uh, you know, they have to do testing with vaccines, whereas the therapeutics, it goes a lot quicker in terms of the process. Yeah. And therapeutics are the quickest because they're already drugs that are approved. They're already drugs that are in the marketplace. So now we've got some, at least one, that is showing some real promise. And that's exactly what people are hoping for. Something to give people hope. What's it going to be? What is it? Well, you've got a drug right now that looks like it could be doing something to help especially critically ill people. All patients are different, so we want to make sure that we're tailoring their therapy to what their actual needs are. In addition, we have seen great advancements in the care of these patients through our wonderful critical care teams and and other hospital teams, and so we want to integrate these therapies into that overall uh, model of care that they're receiving. So they're getting good care, they're fighting this thing off, they're trying everything, and then you've got remdesivir which is a drug that Gilead produced originally was for Ebola virus, and it's showing promise. We have been getting patients better, but we are looking to find a medication that helps patients get better more rapidly, get them home to their families, and make more room for other patients for us to take care of. And I think now we have the first glimmer of hope of something that can do that. Yeah. So, and this is, this is what the reality is. If you get this, and you're in a pretty good health situation. Right? You say you're in your 40s, maybe 50s. You're in pretty good health. You don't have any underlying conditions. More than likely, and I do mean more, like 99% you're going to fight this thing off. There are going to be times when you get sick and sicker and sicker, and you're going to have to seek help. And this might be one of those things that stops you from getting to the point where you have to be hospitalized and potentially put on a ventilator. That's good news. Because when we return to the world, which is going to happen, it'll be comforting knowing that there's something out there that is potentially a treatment that we can say, well, if you do get sick, we can give you this. This will help you recover. Oh, I like that. Yeah, who doesn't like that? And they're already starting to integrate it into treatments. And that is a good thing. And that's not the only thing. It is not without controversy. Just recently, we've had two big studies in reputable sources showing one with no significant effects with the drug and the other with with some good news. So research is ongoing. It's always ongoing. But isn't that funny? Like we were talking earlier about data. So and this is the thing why you need three, two or three really good therapeutics is because Something that may, like the hydrochloroquine did work for some people. It didn't work for others. For others, they had side effects. Even if you watch television, you've ever come across 
a pharmaceutical commercial for something. What does it tell you? You may experience these. Da, 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 da. And it's all kinds of stuff, right? Sweaty palms, right? Your eyes could explode. Your arms may grow longer. You'll breathe out of your ears. Whatever it is. You just got a, you know, chronic diarrhea, heart palpitations. You're like, I don't, this, this sounds worse than whatever it is that you have. Because your DNA and your genetic makeup through your time is, is different than, you know, the than the person next to you, right? As far as genetics play a huge part in it. Your reaction to certain things is going to be different. Some people are allergic to peanuts. Some people aren't. So there's, so that's why having two or three therapeutic things will help because if something doesn't, if A doesn't work, B may work. A worked for her. A didn't work for him, but B worked for him. And A and B failed for this person, but there was a C treatment and it worked. So having several different treatments is going to go a long way until potentially we get a vaccine, which you don't know when that is going to come, if it's going to come at all. But this looks like it's a good thing. Now, on the other side of stuff, what about the people that have had it? Survived it? People who didn't even know they had it, but have the antibodies. The question about the social distancing, right? Because you've heard, like, I've, I, our governor I talked to said, man, isn't it like having the, he said, this is like having the golden ticket if you test positive for the antibodies. Means you can go do more things because maybe there's immunity. No, no, maybe there's not any immunity. It's more than likely, if, if this is like any of the other coronaviruses, there's more. Of course, there's MERS, there's SARS, coronavirus. But you've ever had a cold, coronavirus is part of that family. So what about social distancing at that point? Some people are getting those results back, and then their employers saying, I can't be sure you're recovered. You have to quarantine and can't come back to work for a certain period of time. So not quite ready for widespread use yet and should absolutely not change your social distancing behavior. So if you've had it and you've had the antibodies for it, then don't change anything. It's all confusing. All of it is. All I know is people want to go back to work. All I know is we want to get back to human interaction. High five here. A little bit of dap right there. Hug here. That's what people want. And the information that's flying in is coming in in 20 different ways. And 19 of them are completely different. One has some stuff that kind of mimics some of the other, but it's got its own thing, too. But it's just you don't know. And that's the best way to describe this. At this point in time, you don't know. I don't know. And if you look hard enough, you can find something that fits how you believe this thing's going. But... You're going to have to just go along with whatever your people are saying. And that's the frustrating. I hear it. I understand it. It's overreach. It's ridiculous. We're shutting down beaches. We're shutting down parks. We can't be here. You can't be there. We're stopping this. People can't see their loved ones in the hospital when they're dying and taking their last breaths. They can't go to funerals. It it is nuts. And I think we'll look back and we're going to learn a lot. And not just about this horrible virus. But we're going to learn a lot about how we went about doing things as a community, as a state, as a country. There'll be a lot of things that we'll look back and go, we shouldn't have done that. We shouldn't. Now, officials may say, oh, no, we we did everything we were supposed to. But I think a lot of us right-minded people go, yeah, we overstepped here. We We well overreached here and we panicked here. We can't do that again. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson shows your Twitter. Wounded Paw Project, amazing organization. Been working with them for a while. They rescue dogs. 
How many dogs are being euthanized? Way too many. And they train these dogs. So a dog that's just sitting in, the, in, in a pound or a shelter one day is rescued. And the next thing you know, it's trained to be a shelter, do- a, a, a service dog. So shelter dog to service dog for first responders, veterans, and their families. And it is incredible the work they do. And you can look at all the work they do at WoundedPawProject.org. You can give in several different ways, and they do need your help. You can go to smile.amazon.com and set your supporting group to Wounded Paw Project. They also take cash, great tax-deductible gift, and a vehicle. If you've got an unwanted vehicle, it's a great tax-deductible gift. But what it does is they take those proceeds, and they use them to protect, advocate, and transform those shelter dogs into service dogs for veterans, first responders, and their family. Find out the great works they're doing and how you can help today by going to woundedpawproject.org. That's WoundedPawProject.org or call 844-678-4PAW, 844-678-4729 or WoundedPawProject.org. You'll be saving a paw to save a life. Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show, where we reach across the aisle and occasionally poke someone in the eye. Former Vice President Joe Biden's presidential campaign formally announcing a committee will start vetting potential running mates on Thursday, thus beginning a search that will culminate in one of the campaign's key moments ahead of the Democrats' general election battle with President Donald Trump. Biden has already committed to picking a female running mate, and when his running mate is announced, it will mark the third time in U.S. history a woman has served in the role. Yeah, third time, but there are questions out there still about the potential alleged assault that is getting ignored. But some of the media, the establishment media, the media that would be more on his side, are starting to raise the questions. Now, you'll get the same people out there that, you know, Fox is going to cover it a lot more than MSNBC, but CNN did cover it. The Huffington Post is asking questions. Because there is some hypocrisy in this. He's had 20 events since these serious allegations have come out against him, and he has not been asked one question. That's in stark contrast as to how Brett Kavanaugh was treated when those allegations came forward. And I think it's really calling into question some of the mainstream media, why they're not asking him tough questions, especially yesterday when he had a women's town hall. I think, you know what, that's Rona McDaniel, head of the RNC. She's absolutely Right. Kavanaugh was bombarded. It was nonstop ridiculousness. I think everybody deserves to be heard. Not everyone deserves to be believed because sometimes people aren't telling the truth. But I do believe it is a fair question to ask. Why aren't you asking the question? Why aren't you addressing this the way you should? Because this lady is far more credible if you are, again, whether take out the, because Christine Blasey Ford was like, it was a house, it was kind of over here, I'm not quite sure, but then there was, and that just, it seemed like, okay. And I felt bad because I felt like the DNC rushed her up because they were trying to stop something. Just the RNC is trying to push something through. And it became very political. And this woman was used a, a, as a political football. This woman, her allegations, shouldn't she she be heard? Because the Democrats have come out and pretty much dismissed this across the board. It's no big deal. But that's what everybody does. No, moral high ground. Our side doesn't do stuff like that. Well, hold on here. We're talking about human beings. Reed says after the alleged assault in 1993, she told a few people. She referred us to a friend who says Reed told her Biden put his hand up her skirt during an unwanted encounter. That friend did not want to be named. ABC News also spoke with Reed's brother, Colin Moulton. He told us his sister mentioned in 1993 that she was experiencing, quote, harassment at work. He said he did not know the details until recently. But he later texted us to clarify that he does remember his sister telling him back then that Biden, quote, more or less cornered her against the wall. Now, 
you could say, well, why didn't you say it then? Well, the details are different than I'm being harassed. This guy at work's harassing me, Joe, and I feel uncomfortable. You don't have to go into the sort of details. That's the way they'll spin it. The left will be like, well, why didn't you say something then? The hypocrisy is very real. And the fact that nobody's really asking the question, at least to Biden, is a joke. It is. I don't know what happened. Maybe he did do something. Maybe he didn't. But in this day and age of somebody comes forward, everybody tells us, especially on the left, nope, some people say you have to believe. I say you have to hear. But not so much. And again, I don't know if he did it. This all could be baloney. That is a huge possibility. But the question's out there. And if you're not asking the question, then maybe we need to find somebody who will. Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. Another 3.8 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week, bringing the total during the pandemic to more than 30 million. And that may be far fewer than the real total since states have struggled to process claims. Layoffs accelerated in the country as states move to contain the virus. And even as some places reopen, much of the U.S. economy remains effectively shut down. Yeah. Yeah shut down and now it's the reopening time that's the thing how do you reopen how do you go about reopening it's a new thing for everybody it's very interesting because this is this is my thing yesterday i've seen governors across the country deliver gretchen whitman Right. You know, uh, uh, you go and you look and you see, okay, DeSantis is doing this. Abbott's doing that. You look over here and you've got Newsom, you know, Doug Ducey in in Arizona. And you start just going through all of the, you know, Cuomo. Okay, what do you guys? You've got to be clear. Be black and white. Don't leave any room for interpretation. Don't. Make it a gray area when it comes to reopen. Say this, 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 and this. Yesterday, Doug Ducey, governor of Arizona, comes out. He delivers his, hey, we're staying, we're sheltering in place, but with a caveat. And the caveat, nobody really understands. Everybody left more confused. Abbott was pretty clear, right? It's like, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this, and this is how we're doing it. Cuomo has been pretty, pretty clear. We're doing this. This is how we're going to go. Now he's thinking, okay, well, I'm going to start to open up a few other counties upstate who weren't as affected by this. Because, But you've got to be clear. California, Newsom has been clear, but at the same time allows some stuff. Now we're going back and we're going to shut beaches. And it's it, it don't leave anything open for interpretation. Do the best you can to come out and say, this is what we're doing. These are the rules. We're going to go from there. Some workers also worried. Veronica Fields, a hairstylist in West Virginia, thinks it's too soon to go back to work because the guidelines are so unclear. I think that it's kind of crazy to go from completely shut down, but next Monday I'm going to be expected to figure out how to do full salon services on masked clients while I'm masked. But even if people don't feel safe to go back to work, some will have no choice. States like Iowa and Texas telling workers if they refuse to take their jobs back, they'll lose their unemployment benefits. Which I have zero problems in in some cases. Like my little sister, God bless her, I love her. She's in California. She's making $1,000 a week being on unemployment. 
She didn't make $1,000 a week. She's like, why would I want to go back to a job? And I understand there's fear out there. I, I get that. But some people have it better right now in that situation. Now, that's going to end in July, and all of a sudden the gig could be up, and they're going to be going, oh, my God. But th- let's be real. There are some people out there earning more money. I was laughing. I was like, God. And 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 my other my other little brother, he's still employed. He he works for the Anaheim Ducks. He coaches their youth team. They're still paying him. And she's making far more money than he is. And I think that's kind of funny. It made me laugh a little bit. She's Mark Cookie. She is. Don't agree? But I understand why, you know, it would be tough. And I said, are, are you scared? And she's like, no, I'm not scared, but I'm getting $1,000 a week. It's like nine eighty five or something. I'm like, mm, well, you know what? 19 that's not bad. It's not bad at all. But you have to be clear. You can't come out and say, all right, we're going to open in two weeks, but restaurants, you can open in six days, but with these things... And you're like, well, hold on. You're telling people you can't go out for two weeks, but then you're telling the restaurants they can open in two weeks. And then you're telling this business over here, uh, you, you're you going to be open on Friday if you want to be open. But only by appointment. And then everything else has to be curbside pickup. But you can't do anything in the salon. It's, it's just just come out and say, look, this is what it is. This is how it's going to go. And don't leave any room for interpretation. It's not just America. The world is struggling of when to open. The Germans open. Now they're thinking about closing. There was a spike. Well, of course there's a spike. People are getting back out in society. Down under, they're having trouble. Scott Morrison, Prime Minister, G'day Australia. What does success look like? in a COVID-19 world. It doesn't just look like having a low number of cases. That's not good enough. Having a low number of cases, but having Australians out of work, having a low number of cases and children not receiving in-classroom education, having a low number of cases and businesses not being open, having a low number of cases and Australians not about able to be going about their as normal of lives as possible. That's not what success looks like. He's right. It's not what success looks like. You can't... It's not coming back at once. Success looks like what it was before, which was, this is what it is. We're back in business. We're gr- But that's going to take a long time to get to. We've got to open in a smart way that once we start it, we can't go back. We can't afford stop-start. Because if you think this is bad right now, and it is, imagine if four, six weeks from now, we're going along, and all of a sudden, across the country, there's a few spikes here, a few spikes there, and then governors start just clamping down and Fauci and everybody says, no, we got to shut it down again. That second wave of unemployment and financial just destruction will be massive. So while you take this phases and steps, once you take the first step, know that you're going through all the phases. I would liken it to the fact that if you want to go outside when the sun's shining, you've got to put sunscreen on. This is the same thing. Australians want to return to community sport. If you want to return to a more liberated economy and society, it's important ensuring that we can have eased restrictions, and Australians can go back to the lifestyle and the many things that they previously were able to do. We want that. We all want that. It's just when. That's the question. We see we see what's going on. We see the insanity of, of some of just these crazy like government you can't do this you can't do that now we're gonna you know california's like, ah now we're gonna shut the beaches supervisor don wagner put out a statement via twitter it reads in part that uh, he says he thinks governor newsom does have the right to shut down orange county beaches and the beaches in the entire state 
but thinks it's unwise to do so because he says doctors say fresh air and sunlight help fight the disease. He then issues what might be considered a threat, writing, I fear that this overreaction from the state will undermine the cooperative attitude and our collective efforts to fight the disease. So we'll see what happens and if Governor Newsom winds up following through on what the state chiefs of police say he said he was going to do. So you open stuff up, you allowed some people to go back. Now the parks are going to be shut and you th- nobody wants to stop start. And it's not just businesses, individuals, you, I, everybody. The breaking point is there for a lot of people, and it's growing day by day. The the groundswell of of people that it started out as, you know, release us, let us get out there, this is ridiculous, it, for whatever reasons, whether you thought it was an overreach by the government, or the, that is growing, and that is continuing to grow. And you're finding more and more businesses are willing to defy state rules because they feel like i got to get out there i have to work i have to earn a living when you do this whichever phase that you decide hey we're gonna do this we're gonna do this. you gotta do it you've got to do it you've got to take that step and you've got to move forward and you can't say nope we're gonna we, 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 i know we came out but it was no 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 we got we got to go back in we, we we've got to go back in jerry nadler are eager to reopen their businesses. But you've got several things to consider. Number one, people are not going to come back to restaurants so fast when they're worried about their own health. That's a little premature. Second of all, you can't reopen businesses until we have enough testing that has been done. And far from enough testing has been done to justify allowing people to, to, to reduce the uh, social distancing requirements. The testing thing is weird, too. I'll tell you why. So... You want to open up your state? All right. You have to have, if you're going to follow the CDC, what do you have to have? You have two weeks of showing over. And, and I don't even know what the two weeks is. It is it a, you every single day you have to have less and less than the day before? Or is it cumulative over these two-week period? It was less than the previous two-week period. I, I That I can't tell you. Does it take in deaths or people who have tested positive for it? Or is it a cumulative of those? So let's say over a two-week period, we went down, 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 but we had a big spike, but then we went down, down, down again. And those two weeks, though, if you compare that to the previous two weeks, it's far less. But we did have a big spike here. Do we have to go back? I I, I don't know. Those are things that I, I, I can't tell you with. And as far as testing goes, well, you can make that, as you go. If your governor wants to reopen, you can look at the test. You can manipulate the numbers. How many people are you testing? Some states are testing God knows how many people a day. Some are testing a lot. Some are testing thousands. Some are testing hundreds. It's not like there's, oh, we're going to test 100,000 people a day at each state. That's not happening. And that test is a false flag, too. Because you could get tested today. Two days from now, you can come in contact with somebody. You could then get the virus. You'd have it for two weeks. You'll come in contact with more people. And all the while, you've been tell you don't have it. So that's also a mess. It's confusing. You need to be straightforward. We need to start saying to ourselves, come up with a uniform plan of when we do this, we do it. Whether you're taking a baby step or a giant leap, either way, we're not going backwards. Because the backwards is the thing that most business owners that survived this first one are uncertain about and fear the most. Because they can't. And in, in some cases, even if they can, they won't. Do it again. 323-538-2423 at Chad Benson Show, Twitter. Feel free to tweet at me. You can text the program as well. AMAC, Association of Mature American Citizens, fastest growing organization for people over the age of 50. Great organization. 
They're here to help you with everything from Social Security to Medicare. They've got questions and answers and answers and questions. You name it, they're going to help you with it. They're also out there fighting on your behalf for common sense immigration form, things like that. And they have so many benefits from retail, restaurant, travel discounts, all of those things. So when we do reopen, and we will, you'll be able to take advantage of that. Here's the great thing. The price is amazing. It is free. Free. Free, 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 free. That's right. No credit card, no cash, no check. Nothing's required. You just go and you sign up. You go to amac.us forward slash Chad. It's one year. It's free. It's on me. amac.us forward slash Chad. amac.us forward slash Chad. Chad Benson Show. Get over it. It's time to forge a new path with your very own political cartographer, Chad. The Office of the Director of National Intelligence has issued a rare statement confirming reports that it continues to look at whether the novel coronavirus originated in a Chinese government lab in Wuhan. While the DNI says it's still examining information, the intelligence community also states it concurs with wide scientific consensus that COVID-19 was not man-made or genetically modified. Yeah, wasn't man-made, wasn't genetically modified. Doesn't mean it didn't escape. Because several of the intelligence agencies said, look, they were doing research and there's a chance based on their lax security, which they raised the alarm a couple of years ago, that this thing could have gotten out because they were trying to show America, hey, look at all the stuff we're doing here with viruses and whatnot. It's a possibility as well, or it's a possibility that it came from a wet market. Whatever and wherever it came from, it's here. It's doing damage. We have to figure out how to live with it and live around it for the time being until we figure out how we defeat it, hopefully once and for all. That's the reality. of This day and age of crazy politics, lunacy, my side versus your side, you would think... You would think for a hot second, both sides could come together and not make it political. You would think they'd say, look, we got to do what's right for the American people. We're asking them to sacrifice a lot. And in some cases, we're asking them to sacrifice everything they've built up and worked hard for their whole life. And that's in hopes that we find something quicker, sooner rather than later, and we get out of this mess with as little damage as possible. But they can't even do that. Like everything has to be politics and it does get old. You know, yeah, I get people on both sides who they, they get mad because one minute I I say something about Trump that they don't like and the next minute I will say something about Trump that they do like and the other side says I can't believe you said that because we no longer live in a world of Any kind of, hey, I'm independent, I'm free thinking, it's you got to choose a side. And it's come that way with the damn virus. That's what drives me even more crazy than the the shutdown is the fact that we have a right and left virus. The right gets branded as they all think it's a hoax and everybody over there is willing to sacrifice grandma. And that's not true. The left gets branded as go inside, give the government all the power in the world and cower. And that's not true. Everybody approaches this in a different way. Everybody wants to get back to work. We all want to get to the same damn place. And we just can't seem to do it with a smile on our face and recognize that we all have fears and that we can recognize each other's fears because we're too busy Trying to win an argument over what? It's ridiculous. Weekend. I could see Friday. It's right there. I could almost touch it. You have a good rest of your day. Be kind to one another. We are going to get through this. And if we get through it with a smile, that's even better. 
Things will come back. Things will not only get better, they'll be better. But it isn't happening tomorrow. Have a good rest of your day. As always, night, night, Jack. This is the Chad Benson Show.